Michael. If you know anything about handguns, you know that if your thumb is on the trigger and not your index finger, that means the barrel is pointed at you and you are having a very bad day or days, as is now my situation. You see, two days ago, I was served with divorce papers. For some men, it would be like a pardon from their jailer and a cause for celebration. I love my wife more than anything in the world. Instead of celebrating, I sat on my porch, staring down the barrel of my revolver. We had been arguing for the past couple of months, and she had been particularly irritable for some reason, but I chalked it up to her upcoming birthday. I think her 50th birthday is hard for her. As you know, my wife is already going through a change, as it is usually described. This is a problem if you are a man in a marriage. A cryptic remark meant to offend, or the phrase, I have a headache when I was trying to be more affectionate, really knocks me down. As I said, this went on for months, but you endured it because you married in health and in sickness. But the last two weeks have been unbearable. When she spoke to me, I almost wished she wouldn't do it. She limited our conversation to some insult to my courage or my inability to satisfy her in bed. Of course, reminding her of the past 25 years without complaint was met with the ever derogatory, I faked it every time. Okay, there's no denying it. The love of my life has been an incredible bitch these past two weeks. I wasn't going to take any more from this flaming witch I once called my wife, so I packed a bag and kept it in the car, just in case. But I had a task that needed to be completed, even if she didn't appreciate it. I planned a big party for her birthday with a professional event planner about two months ago. Rachel has planned several of our corporate events in the past, so I knew she was the one I wanted to hire to plan my wife's 50th birthday. We met at a hotel near my work in the hotel lounge to discuss the party. This was the same hotel where the party was planned. This way, all of our out-of-town relatives and friends could enjoy the party without having to travel far for a good night's sleep. We were supposed to meet once a week in the beginning, but as the birthday approached, we were meeting at least twice a week. During this time, I almost canceled the party due to my wife's behavior, which turned into outright hostility towards me. But... I hoped the party would show her how much I truly loved her and that would bring her back from the dark side. At least bring her back enough to stop her from turning into a screaming banshee who took over the body of the woman I loved. Rachel confirmed that everyone was ready to come and be a part of the great celebration. She even handled calls and booked flights and hotels for our entire large family. She really outdid herself. As a token of gratitude for a job well done, I invited her and her husband to come to the party, hand it over to her assistants, and enjoy the actual event she was planning. In total, about 100 relatives and friends confirmed their participation in the party. My Sandy has always been the greatest friend, mother, grandmother, co-worker, and wife I have ever known. This was until recently. A 38 special bullet pointed at me. Should do the job right. Not many survive when this type of bullet cuts into flesh. Shot from that close, parts of the bullet might even pass through my body, but the destruction left behind would make a medical examiner lose his appetite. Most guys would say I'm an idiot dying over a woman, and it's hard to disagree with them. But I always thought that my wife and I had a special marriage. We've been through a lot in our marriage. We started from scratch, living in a trailer, struggling to pay rent and food. Those early days were filled with love and lots of sex. They say that you can't live on love alone, but we were very close to this. We both ended up having some lucky breaks, and our jobs gave us everything we needed to save for a down payment on a house. When our Jenna was born, we were excited and scared at the same time. How are we going to support her and save for a house? It was difficult, but Jenna never lacked. It took a little longer, but our down payment allowed us to buy a small two-bedroom house in a decent area. There was even a yard big enough for Jenna to play outside. Two years later, Jenna had a sister to play with, Haley. Both girls were loved and loved us back. None of them gave us any problems and were excellent students. Eventually, they met decent men who became their husbands and started families of their own. Of course, they would never miss their mother's birthday. The morning before I was served with the divorce papers, my wife and I had a huge fight. I lost my patience because she refused to talk to me, 
and after spending another night sleeping on an uncomfortable chair bed, I was too tired to put up with any more nonsense. I said some terrible things to her, trying to hurt her the way she hurt me. I even said something to the effect that since she doesn't appreciate me, maybe I'll find someone who can. The look on her face showed that I had hit the mark, but I immediately regretted it and tried to apologize, but she turned around and left the house. That day just happened to be my wife's birthday. I was so angry with her that I completely forgot what day it was. That afternoon I was served with divorce papers and my heart stopped. How could everything go wrong so quickly in just two months? My calls to her cell phone went unanswered and calls to her office were rejected. My wife's secretary, Blanche, couldn't connect my calls either. We were friends and she was my accomplice in organizing the party. She was responsible for making sure that my wife's schedule was clear and that she arrived at the hotel on time. She didn't understand why my wife was behaving so badly. When she tried to talk to her, my wife would just shake her head and start crying. She told me that she would keep trying, but assured me that she would definitely get my wife to the hotel, even if she had to kidnap her. Given that her husband was a former professional lineman, I knew she wasn't kidding. I didn't want to drag her into my family problems, so I didn't tell her about the divorce. Of course, when someone receives divorce papers like I did out of the blue, I read the front page headline and went ballistic. After the shock wore off, I became angry. I mean, really angry. I told my boss I was taking the day off and left. The small bag I had already packed was not enough, so I went home. My anger still drove me, and by this time I was so angry that if Satan himself had stood in front of me and laughed, I would have torn his head off and shit on his neck. I collected everything. I mean every single thing that was mine. I took off my wedding ring and placed it on the kitchen table next to my birthday card. All this and my phone were all I left in a house I never expected to find myself in again. The bags were thrown in the back of my SUV and everything else was in the trailer I was towing behind me. I left the city, heading to the only place I had left. This will most likely be my permanent home from this day forward, so it's a good thing I brought all my stuff. It turns out I actually had very little. I guess it comes from my upbringing about living a simple life, but live with love. Look where this got me. Our hut is located a hundred miles from here, in a very quiet place. There is a small town nearby where you can buy supplies and stuff, but not much else. It was here on the porch, that I stared down the barrel of my revolver, trying to work up the courage to shoot myself in the head. After I arrived at the hut, I finally read the divorce petition in the envelope. Inside, I found a photograph of me sitting at a table with a very attractive woman. There was no denying that I was caught, but not for what my wife thought. The photo was of me and Rachel planning my wife's birthday two weeks ago. That was the last time we met in a hotel bar. It was also the night I saw my wife's friend. I didn't know at the time, but she thought I was cheating with Rachel. The thought of my wife believing that I cheated on her hurt me even more than the divorce itself. If my wife just told me that she didn't love me anymore and wanted to continue living without me, it would be painful, but I would eventually get over it. But the belief that I cheated on her and that she didn't face with me and just filed for divorce was too much. Sandy, I can't believe what a bastard my husband is. He acts as if nothing happened and that he loves me. Well, he's finished. I won't tolerate this. If, and I emphasize if, he confesses and asks for forgiveness, I might leave him. I'll make his life miserable and keep him in the ass for months, if not years, but he'll beg for it every damn time. Did he really think he wouldn't get caught? Thank God for Beverly, who caught him in the hotel lounge. It's hard to say how long this lasted, but I have a guess. It must have started two months ago when he started coming home late. That's when he probably started sleeping with that bitch. Wasn't it bad enough that my hormones were all mixed up because I was going through menopause? My God, a woman really feels like crap when this happens. And was he understanding? No, I'm getting old and he goes and finds himself a younger and better-built woman, younger than our children. I hope he enjoys sex with this slut, considering how much it will cost him. Like Ivana Trump, 
don't be mad. Get it all. On the morning of my birthday, that bastard of a husband didn't even wish me a happy birthday. Instead, he was just an angry brute. I definitely wasn't going to let him sleep in my bed after he had that bitch. Who knows what diseases he caught from her, and I wasn't about to let him infect me. After I found out what he was doing with that bitch, I knew it was over between us. I know I said I'd give him a chance if he confessed, but I knew that was a lie. I just couldn't do it. When Beverly told me what she saw and showed me a photo of the happy couple, I was ready. The next day, I turned to the shark in a legal shirt and began the paperwork process. My lawyer is the devil's hair. She hates cheaters more than anything in the world. She has friends in court, so my divorce case will be expedited for maximum effect and maximum pain. My husband will have nothing left after I'm done with him. This is only fair, considering that I put up with him for 25 years, and when I got old, he got himself some kind of pie with hanging breasts. I admit, I will miss him. God, this man could pin me to the mattress and leave me shaking afterwards. Okay, maybe I'll keep him around just for the sex. Wait, what? Never. I'll find a young stallion capable of repeat performance. I will teach him how to please me. I just need to get my hormones straightened out first so we can have sex all day long. But if I keep Michael on a tight leash, I can force him to have sex with me anytime I want, just out of guilt. Yes, that's what I need. I'll get all his money and his boy whenever I want. This divorce might not be so bad. But damn it, why did he do it? Why wasn't I good enough for him? And he did it on my 50th birthday. It's hard enough to become a year older, but when you add your husband's betrayal to the mix, that's why I forced him to get the divorce papers on my birthday. That and his damn comment about how he will find someone who can appreciate him more than me. This statement hurt. I wasn't going to give him the pleasure of seeing me cry, so I left the house, confident in my plans. The divorce papers were ready, and all my lawyer needed was my call. She received it on her way to work. Three hours later, my phone started ringing. There was no way I was going to talk to that bastard now. It was too late. Soon my secretary's phone started ringing. I heard Blanche talking to Michael, but I couldn't make out what they were saying other than she couldn't connect his calls and something about a party. What party? Fuck you, who cares? I'm divorcing the love of my life because he cheated on me. My life is over. My secretary kept trying to get me to talk to her, but I could only burst into tears. A few hours later, I began to accept things as they came. This was turning into the crappiest birthday ever. It was late afternoon when Blanche and her husband, Stan, were standing outside my office door. One thing I know for sure about Blanche's husband is that he is the greatest and kindest man I have ever met. If he tells you to do something, you do it simply out of fear, although he will never lay a hand on you. However, this time, his look told me that he could make me do something I didn't want to do. Want to. Blanche told me we were going to a party and they wouldn't take no for an answer. I was about to open my mouth to say that I had no time for this, but I saw the look on Stan's face. Instead, I nodded, grabbed my purse, and walked slowly with them. I just got to the door and burst into tears, throwing myself into Blanche's arms and hugging her tightly, sobbing like a baby. She asked me what was wrong, but at first I couldn't answer. I think I said something like, this is my worst birthday ever. Blanche and Stan looked lost, not knowing what was wrong or what they could say or do. Blanche hugged me and said, don't be so sure. I didn't understand what she meant, but I didn't care. Life without Michael is not worth living, even if he was a cheater. They put me in the back seat of their car and drove towards the city center. When I asked it where we were going, they said to the hotel. When I heard the name of the hotel, I said no, I'm not going to the place where Michael had his girlfriend. Their eyes became huge and their mouths opened in amazement. They refused to believe that Michael could do something like that. I told them that I had proof and that I had filed divorce papers against Michael earlier that day and that was why he called the way he did. To say that Blanche and Stan were shocked would be an understatement. 
I heard Stan say something about trying to contact Michael before he did something stupid. I never thought that Michael would harm himself. Why does he need this? He had his young mistress. Why would he be upset that I filed for divorce? We got to the hotel, and Blanche literally pulled me out of the car and not so gently led me through the lobby to the conference room. Standing at the door was the bitch with whom my husband cheated. What are you doing here, bitch? Isn't it enough for you that you took my husband away from me? You also want to rub it in my face? She just stood there in shock, barely able to speak. Blanche stepped between us and introduced Rachel as the woman Michael had hired to plan my birthday party. Rachel opened the door and Blanche pushed me inside to over a hundred people shouting, Happy Birthday! My daughters ran up to me and hugged me tightly, telling me happy birthday again and that they loved me. But they were worried about their father, why he had not come yet. At that moment, I understood. I realized that I was wrong and that I had just ruined my life. I must have fainted. The medics and my family and friends hovered over me, worried. I started screaming about Michael. Where is Michael? He should be here. He just has to. I had to tell him I was sorry. I had to make him forgive me. My daughters and everyone else in the family tried to call Michael for hours, but to no avail. In the end, everything became clear. How I thought Michael was having an affair with Rachel, and how I filed divorce papers against him a few hours ago. I never thought my daughters would look at me with such contempt, but they did. Why did I become such a bitch? It should be said that the party broke up. There was nothing left to celebrate. The doctors said that I was fine, but that I should avoid further worries. They gave me a sedative to calm me down, and since it was late, my daughters took me to the room reserved for Michael and I for a little private post-holiday celebration. While I was sedated and asleep, my brothers-in-law went to my house looking for Michael. Only in the morning did I find out how successful my divorce petition was. When I was told that Michael had left, leaving behind only his wedding ring, his phone number, and a birthday card, I became hysterical again, prompting another medical visit and a trip to the hospital, where I was kept for two days. During these two days, I talked to a psychologist, psychiatrist, or some kind of head doctor. Then they ordered all kinds of blood tests to see if there was another reason for my bad behavior, other than the fact that I was just a bitch. Tests showed that my cholesterol levels were so high, they were off the charts and some kind of hormonal imbalance that usually accompanies perimenopause. However, my situation was worse than usual. They gave me a prescription and sent me home, on the condition that I could remain calm and not be left alone until the medicine took effect. There was still a fear that I might harm myself, so my daughters and their families agreed to stay until the problems were resolved. After they brought me home, I ran into the house, calling for Michael, but all I heard was just an echo in an empty house, devoid of my husband. When I walked into the bedroom and saw that Michael's dresser drawers and his side of the closet were empty, I lost control again. My daughters hugged me and cried with me, telling me everything would be fine one minute and the next, asking how I could be so stupid as to think that Daddy would cheat on me. We'd only been home an hour when I sat at the table, looking at Michael's wedding ring, still lying where he'd left it. Beneath it was an envelope with my name on it. His handwriting was so recognizable that it wasn't hard to see how much care he put into writing my name. Jenna sat with me and reached her limit with me. She grabbed the envelope and began to read it. Tears quickly appeared in her eyes as she read silently. After she finished, she passed it on to her sister, who followed suit with her own tears. She gave me a card, but I was afraid to take it. Haley pressed it into my hands and ordered me to read the damn thing. The card was a typical greeting from a husband to his wife after many years of marriage. It talked about his love for me and how his life was better because I agreed to let him be my husband, and every birthday since then was another reason to celebrate. The handwritten part of the card ripped my heart out. He explained how I had treated him for the past two months and how he hoped the reason for my mistreatment was because I was turning 50, and that he hoped the birthday party would smooth out the transition through the Big Five so we could recover and get along the rest of our days together. But receiving the divorce papers showed him a new reality, and he wasn't about to go quietly. When I refused to answer his calls, 
he realized it was truly over, so he packed up everything he had and decided to give me everything I wanted in the divorce. However, he wouldn't let me take the hut. This is where he drew the line. Since I had never visited the cabin anyway, he was going to fight to keep it. That's where I'll find him, in this damn hut. I never liked this place, too far from civilization, and it smelled from there. Yes, I sometimes went there with him to spend a couple of days, but that was many years ago. Now only Michael and my brothers-in-law used the cabin for fishing. We packed everyone into two cars and headed to the hut. It was only a two-hour drive, but it felt like we were taking forever to get there. I prayed that Michael would at least talk to me when we arrived. Our daughters being there will make him talk. He could never refuse them anything. With every mile, I replayed the last two months in my head, and I didn't like what I saw. How can this man still love me after everything I've done to him? I don't think I could have been so forgiving if he had done to me what I did to him. Michael When it comes down to it, I'm just a coward. My thumb squeezed the trigger several times, but I couldn't do it. Maybe a little liquid courage. I knew there was nothing in the hut, so I drove into town. The store had a limited selection of whiskey, but didn't really care if it tasted good or not. I just needed a little help to gather my courage and pull the trigger. Every sip reminded me why I never drank hard liquor. It just tastes terrible, but after numbing my tongue, it wasn't so bad. It didn't take long before I started to feel the alcohol taking away the pain. Hell, if a little whiskey takes the pain away, maybe more whiskey will take it away altogether. A few more sips started to make me sleepy. I thought a few more sips would give me enough courage to pull the trigger. I imagined the hangover would be hellish if I was still alive in the morning. But since that was unlikely, I continued drinking. Sandy Jenna's husband knew the way to the cabin better than anyone. Michael allowed him and his friends to use the cabin whenever they wanted for a few days of fishing. We turned off the main road onto the driveway of the cabin. As I drove up, I noticed that the place looked completely different from the last time I was here. It was no longer a shack. It looked like a vacation home. There were solar panels on the roof and a new garage workshop on the side. Now there were no thickets of weeds. Instead, there were flower and vegetable gardens. I asked Jenna's husband, William, when Michael made all these changes because the place looked great. He said that between himself, Haley's husband Brent, and his father-in-law, they had all been doing it a little bit over the last few years, and that Michael had set up a family trust so it would go to the girls after he died so it would never come out of families. This had been Michael's family land since before we were married, and he had every right to do whatever he wanted with it. I felt even worse when I realized that the divorce papers even mentioned taking it away from him. At least now I knew that no matter what happened, it would always remain in our family, even if I was no longer a part of that family. Michael's car was parked in front of the cabin, so we knew he was there. If he hadn't been there, I would have known that he decided to just disappear, and I would have lost him forever. William told me and the girls to stay in the cars until he and Brent got inside to make sure Michael was okay. From their looks, I realized that there was a possibility that Michael might have come here to harm himself. The thought that Michael could come here to die shook me to the core. If Michael came here to die, I'll lose my daughters too. They would never forgive me for this. I prayed again as I watched William and Brent approach the cabin. There was no light inside only a spotlight from the garage. William and Brent found the front door unlocked and heard them calling for Michael. They walked in slowly, turning on the light in the front room. They kept calling for Michael, but I could tell. They weren't getting an answer. I saw the light turn on at the back of the hut, and that's when I noticed the new wooden deck. Not even a minute later, Brent came out on deck and waved us out of the car into the back of the cabin. His expression was almost funny, so Michael must have been fine. I jumped out of the car and what I saw was my husband lying unconscious on a sun lounger with a half-empty bottle of whiskey in his lap. I started laughing involuntarily until I realized why he was drinking. I walked up to him, raised my hand to his cheek when I noticed what was in his right hand. I dropped to my knees and cried like a child when I realized that Michael had really come here to die. 
The revolver lay in his palm with his thumb on the trigger, which meant that he was really going to kill himself. William carefully pulled the weapon out of his hand. Jenna and Haley joined me in crying as they realized how close they were to losing their father. Michael didn't react to anything, not even a little. Brent and William decided it was best to leave Michael where he was because he would most likely be vomiting from whatever was in his stomach when he woke up. I told the kids to go inside and settle in for the night and get a couple of blankets. I was going to sleep here next to my husband so I could take care of him when he woke up. My daughters weren't sure how their father would react to me being there so soon after filing for divorce, but I told them that I was the one who messed it up, so I had to fix it. After my family went to bed and I had time to sit outside with my husband, I prayed for some guidance on how to make things right. I asked for strength to accept that I may have lost my husband because of my actions, but I asked for him to be given the peace he deserves. I thanked God for giving me Michael and how I regretted doubting my husband and if he would give me another chance so I could make my husband love me again. By this time, you would have thought there were no tears left, but there were some. I put my arm around Michael's and held it while I spoke to him. I told him how much I truly loved him and how much I regretted ruining all his efforts to organize my birthday party. I asked him to forgive me and give me another chance. I found myself kneeling next to him with my head in his lap, still praying, hoping it wasn't too late. I noticed movement inside at the patio doors and saw my daughters looking at me. They both had tears running down their cheeks and had smiles on their faces. I think they then forgave me for what I had done and knew that they would do everything they could to help me and my father reunite. After they returned upstairs, I lay down on the lounge chair next to Michael. Looking at the night sky, I realized how truly magnificent it is here. I had never seen so many stars, and the silence was very calming. Now I understood why Michael loved this place so much. I wondered why I didn't see this place as it could have been, rather than as it was. It wasn't until Michael spoke to me that I realized I was still talking out loud. The shock of his voice and the way he looked at me made me jump. Michael, what the hell have I done? Why didn't I die? Son of a bitch. I fainted. I can't even kill myself properly. And who the hell is crying on my lap? Why the hell is she here? Damn enough questions. Oh, damn, my head and stomach hurt. It hurts too much to even move. And if I do, I'll throw up. And I hate being sick. Lie still, idiot. Just lie still, I tell myself. I lie there and listen to Sandy cry. She continues to say how sorry she is, how she hopes for a second chance, and that I will forgive her for being such a bastard and filing for divorce. She is so sorry that she hurt me so much that I considered suicide, and that no matter what happened, she will never forgive herself for what she did. This went on for a long time until she finally seemed to calm down enough to stop crying. I felt her rise from my lap and lie down next to me on the lounger, but she was still holding my hand. All this time I was still internally struggling with my head and stomach, but I was more interested in how things would turn out with Sandy. I still loved that bastard, even after everything she had done. You can't just turn off over 25 years of love in one night. If I could, I wouldn't have put a gun to my head earlier. She was quiet for a while, but I continued to listen. If she came to some kind of discovery while sitting here on this veranda, I wouldn't want to miss it. This place has a special tranquility, the kind that you can only feel at night when you open up to him. She must not have realized that she was still speaking out loud. I did the same thing several times. It's as if you are talking to God, as if he is there with you, helping you along a path that has not yet been chosen. As she described what she felt and saw as she looked up at the night sky, I could feel it with her. We've had this connection throughout our marriage, but lately, it just hasn't been there. When Sandy calmly said, Now I understand why you come up here, Michael. It is surprisingly quiet and calming here. I truly believe that I could live here with you and would never regret a single day, but only if it's with you. I quietly replied, I want that too, but you're divorcing me. Sandy, I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard Michael address me. I thought he was still unconscious from drinking. His words had barely left his mouth when I threw myself into his lap, hugging him so tightly, sobbing like a little girl who had lost her Barbie doll. 
My apologies and requests for forgiveness began again. However, after a few seconds, he told me to get off his lap. At first, I thought he was rejecting me, and I refused to let him go that I would never let him go if he gave me a second chance. Instead, he warned me that he was going to throw up and that I had better leave or I would get dirty with what was in his stomach. I had barely started to move when he pushed me aside. He ran out of the veranda and emptied his stomach into the flower garden. Poor Michael couldn't stop vomiting. His moans were so loud that they woke up the rest of the family. When they started laughing and making comments about Michael not drinking enough, I had to rebuke them to stop. My daughters asked me why, because he deserved it by drinking so much. I had to remind them why he was drinking in the first place and what he was holding in his hand when we found him. The shock of remembering why we were here brought everyone back to reality. By this time, Michael had finally stopped vomiting, and I sat down next to him, hugging him. My tears began to flow again, and my apologies resumed. Next thing I knew, Haley was handing me a wet wipe, a towel, and a glass of water. Come on, Michael, let me help you get clean. Then you need to lie down again. After you wake up, we'll talk. He wiped his face and rinsed his mouth. My heart filled with joy when he stopped and looked into my eyes, telling me that he loved me, always had, and always would. However, he said he wouldn't talk to me until the divorce was stopped, and I swore on my soul that I believed he didn't cheat on me with Rachel and never cheated on me. There will be no discussion until I agree to these terms. If not, leave now and never come back. I agreed instantly and told him that I was sorry for accusing him of cheating and that I knew he didn't cheat on me with Rachel and that I had already apologized to her. Looking into his eyes, I swore that I knew in my heart that he had never deceived me and would never do so. When I told him I stopped the divorce before I left the hospital, he looked at me with concern. Michael, I will never again have to hear about the dangers of drinking strong alcohol, especially cheap alcohol. I'm not sure I'll ever be able to get the taste of partially digested whiskey out of my mouth. The flower garden will probably die by morning. When Sandy sat down next to me and hugged me like she used to do when I was feeling down, it felt right. I knew I would always love her, but I couldn't stay with her if she thought I was cheating. I have my pride, you know. It would be better to let her go and let her find someone she could trust. Listening to her when she thought I was still asleep, I knew she had changed her mind due to her incessant apologies and crying. But the pain was still with me, and I must admit, a good deal of the anger was there too. Perhaps that's why, when Sandy asked us to talk, I gave her ultimatums. She is the party responsible for the situation in which we find ourselves. I am a victim and have been for the past two months. So I have no intention of forgetting everything as if nothing happened. This damn bitch filed for divorce on me. Breathe. Breathe deeply. Slowly. If I don't calm down, I'll have to visit the flower garden again. However, when she said she was in the hospital, I immediately became worried. I may be mad at her, but I still love her. When I looked into her eyes, I saw the woman I loved deeply. Her eyes didn't deceive her, and I knew she still felt the same way about me. She didn't go into detail, but said she was fine nothing to worry about, and that we'd talk about everything after I woke up. Not wanting to argue and make myself nauseous again, I laid back down on the lounge chair as she pulled the blanket over me and took her place next to me. When I woke up again, it was after dawn, and I could hear noises in the kitchen. Apparently the women were cooking breakfast using every pot and pan we had. It sounded more like God bowling and throwing a strike every time. Oh, damn, I'll never drink whiskey again. As I moved my feet off the edge of the lounge chair, I noticed that Sandy was no longer next to me. I felt the loss, just like all the previous nights since this started. It's more than just the cozy feeling you get when you sleep with someone you've loved for over a quarter of a century. That feeling becomes part of who you are, how you act, how you live. And when Sandy became that bitch from hell and I started sleeping in the chair, I woke up every morning feeling like something was missing from my life. When I packed all my things, I was sure that I would never feel the same again. It was more than just the loss of waking up without your wife. I left my home feeling like I had lost part of my soul. Sure, I was angry, beyond angry, actually. 
but the pain was still there, fueled by her actions. It was only when I arrived here, in my quiet place, and read what was inside the envelope that was handed to me that I felt completely lost. The woman I swore on my soul to in front of our family, friends, and God thought I was a cheater for finding another woman. In over 25 years, there has never been another woman who could replace my Sandy. That she believed I was having an affair with Rachel, or did at the time, still hurts. It was the belief that I could do this to her that made me consider suicide. Of course, the hangover I was suffering from made me wish I was dead, but I wasn't having any luck. Surprisingly, I no longer felt nauseous, but I wasn't too confident that my guts would play by the rules. I got up from the lounge chair and walked inside, hoping the woman would stop talking so loudly. Sandy. After I put Michael back down and covered him with the blanket, not even a minute passed before he closed his eyes again and fell asleep. I watched him for several minutes, wondering how I could ever doubt him. How could I become such a nasty bitch? Doctors said hormonal imbalances from perimenopause were to blame, but they couldn't blame it all. I turned 50 three days ago and it hit me hard. I've been thinking about this for months. I know it's just a number and you're as old as you feel. But still, I turned 50. There is no way Michael would want to stay with an older woman with wrinkles. My husband exercises regularly and is slim and fit. I see women licking their lips at it all the time, and it makes me feel so insecure. Michael is my life, and I'm afraid that he will get tired of me and find a young beauty with big breasts to satisfy him. How can I compete with this? I love my husband, but I just don't feel like having sex with him as often as he wants. The look of refusal on his face hurts me. But what should I do? I know that a man needs sex, but I just don't have the same desires as before. When I do feel guilty and agree to give it to him, it takes me forever to get into it. And Michael thinks I don't like him anymore. It's not him. It's me. So when Beverly told me that she had seen Michael at a hotel table with a beautiful young woman and how he had been coming home late lately, I assumed that he had finally gotten tired of me and had found my replacement. After Beverly showed me a photo of my husband and Rachel from her cell phone, I was sure. I could see the admiration in her eyes. To my shame, I later learned that it was her admiration for a man who loved his wife enough to throw her a lavish 50th birthday party. It was still dark outside and Michael was resting, so I tried to calm myself by leaning back and listening to my surroundings. Little rustles began with the chirping of insects and the singing of birds in their morning songs. It's really peaceful here. I guess growing up as a girl in the city, I never gave this place a chance. Another regret I hope to overcome. That is, if Michael lets me. Sleep must have taken me again. Jenna woke me up by touching my shoulder and asking if I wanted a cup of coffee. I nodded, saying that I would be there in a minute. Michael was still fast asleep, but I knew he would wake up with a terrible hangover and probably be grumpy. I know we were supposed to talk, but he needed to be in the right mood for it. Jenna handed me a cup of hot coffee when I walked in and asked how I was feeling. I told her it was better, but I was still very concerned. Tears flowed down my cheeks again. Before I knew it, Jenna and Haley were by my side, telling me everything would be okay. That they know that their dad also loves me too much to give up a wonderful 25 years of marriage, and that in the end, this was just a small bump in the road. I chuckled at the thought, but stated that it was not just an obstacle, but rather a pothole in the Ohio road that never gets filled, and it was my own fault. How can I fix my relationship with Michael? What can I say or do to make him understand how sorry I am for everything and I want to remain his wife, grow old with him and die holding his hand? How can I do it? Even though my daughters were holding me, my sons-in-law were still moving around the kitchen preparing breakfast. Of course, being men, they have as much grace as a waiter buffalo. The noise hurt my ears and I don't suffer from a hangover. I could imagine how Michael would feel if he didn't sleep. This thought didn't even have time to leave my head when I heard someone drop a frying pan and a groan from behind us. Michael, as soon as I walked in the back door, some clumsy guy dropped a frying pan. She must have bounced a hundred times before she was grabbed, only to be dropped again. 
As if I didn't feel bad enough lately, my loving family had to make my head explode. All I could do was cover my ears with my hands, praying to the gods to make it stop. Jesus Christ, why are you trying to kill me? My eyes were closed, and my hands were still covering my ears, but I knew for a fact that William and Brent had started laughing. At least they quietly said, Sorry, Dad. I told them to keep it down and try not to wake up the billions of people in China with the next dropped frying pan while I went to take a shower. Also, leave me some coffee and I'd like to try and eat something that wasn't burnt when I get back. Before I took two steps, Sandy was next to me, looking at me as if someone had killed her puppy. The sadness in her eyes was so strong that I began to feel sympathy for her. If her eyes reflected even a fraction of her pain, then she must have been on the verge of a catastrophic collapse. I must admit that her suffering, even if only a little, gave me some satisfaction. Maybe, just maybe, it would work out. But she certainly wouldn't have it all easy. There was also something else in Sandy's eyes. Beneath the pain, I could see her pleading for even the slightest hope that I still loved her. As if, if I rejected her right then and there, it could permanently damage our relationship. Her body was so tense and rigid, like an elastic band that was too tight. If I wanted, I could destroy not only the person, but also her soul. There was only one thing I could do. I looked at her and opened my arms. Sandy rushed towards me, hugging me so tightly I thought she might break my rib. Of course there was crying. I was still struggling with a splitting headache and nausea, so when she grabbed me the way she did and cried so loudly that I had to start wondering what it would be like to sit on a pile of fire ants just to not lose the battle with my stomach. Come on, Sandy. Let me come to my senses and try to eat breakfast. We'll talk after that. She squeezed me a little tighter and nodded her head against my chest. Sandy kissed me softly on the lips, apologized again and told me she loved me allowing me to go take a shower. Showering and shaving made me more human. Hell, I haven't showered since I got here a few days ago. What's the point? I came here to start a new life. Life without a nagging wife. So if I wanted to smell like a woodland animal, that was my God-given right, right? Clothes free from three days of body odor and vomit splatter were certainly an improvement on the outside and a little better on the inside. Mostly, if I had to admit, it was Sandy's hug that made me feel better. But then again, hugging my wife always felt good. When I went downstairs, I noticed that my revolver was back in the gun cabinet, hanging on its hook with the cylinder open. A slight tug on the glass doors showed that they didn't trust me yet. It was padlocked and no doubt out of my reach anytime soon. My brothers-in-law were the only ones who knew where I kept the key and it wasn't in its usual place. With grandchildren around the cabin, weapons were always provided. I guess I was demoted to child status after I was found doing stupid things with guns. I felt like they were looking at me. When I turned around, everyone was looking at me with worried looks. Remembering what I was thinking earlier, I was filled with shame. If I managed to commit suicide, it would destroy my children and grandchildren. At that moment, I thought that my wife would be happy to see me dead. With life insurance, I was worth more dead than alive, so she could find herself a new man without the hassle of divorce, while still being rich. Her status would be elevated to that of a sugar mummy. But now that I look at her, I see that it would have killed her too. The fact that I couldn't hold my alcohol down turned out to be a good thing in the long run. I smiled at everyone saying that I was sorry for thinking that suicide was a way to get rid of my pain and that it was not something I would ever consider again. Sandy When Michael walked up to the gun cabinet, I panicked. I was ready to rush at him when he reached for the door handle, but it didn't open. Thank God William locked up the gun. By the time Michael turned around, we were all looking at him. His face showed apparent remorse, or perhaps even shame, for his attempt to commit suicide. His apology was sincere and accepted by all of us. I dragged him into the kitchen and sat him down at the table with a cup of coffee. Everyone was silent, afraid of saying the wrong thing, until the bravest of the family, our youngest Haley, intervened. Okay, Dad, what was it with you and that damn gun? 
Well, so much for coffee and breakfast before the interrogation. Michael. So much for coffee and breakfast before the interrogation. The anger that brought me here has all but disappeared. The enormous pain of my wife believing I had cheated on her had subsided a little, but remained, even though she now knows better. Since you are all my family, I will tell you so that there is no doubt about my sincerity. When your mother filed for divorce on me, I was absolutely furious. I put up with her nonsense for months, was humiliated, insulted, emotionally and sexually neglected, while still trying to organize a birthday she would never forget, in the hopes that it would make her 50th birthday less painful and bring a little happiness back into her life. After I was handed the documents, it became clear to me that she wanted me out, so if she wanted me out, I would definitely get out. Everything that's mine is in my trailer. My thought was, go to hell. But after I got here and opened the envelope from her lawyer and finally read that she was divorcing me for cheating, well, the anger turned into absolute despair. After loving a woman for over 25 years, literally giving her my heart and soul, she believed I cheated on her. It was like depriving you of your life, of your existence. I'm not perfect, but I thought I was a good husband. To know that the woman I swore to love, respect, cherish, and forsake all others, now believed that I had willingly and selfishly broken my sacred vow, well, it killed me. I died inside, and the thought of being forced to live in a world where she thought I could be such a disgusting person and deliberately cause her such pain was too much for me to handle. Something in me broke. That's why I wanted to die. But I was too weak to pull the trigger. I held the gun to my head a few times and couldn't do it, so I figured if I had a few drinks, the alcohol would help me become man enough to forget about what I was actually doing. I knew your mother would eventually find someone new. She is one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen. And since I would have died, she could move on without regret or worry, since I would have died a traitor. Instead, I drank too much and, well, you all know the rest. My family looked at me, realizing how close they were to losing me. Even my brothers-in-law were on the verge of tears. Sandy was inconsolable. She buried her head in her hands, sobbing so hard she was shaking. I expressed my feelings too well, and it wasn't pretty for anyone. Our daughters wrapped their arms around her, trying to give her any emotional support they could. She was still fragile, knowing that she was responsible for the situation we were in. Other than the crying, the kitchen was pretty quiet. Unable to take any more drama, I stood up, poured myself a new cup of coffee, and walked out onto the veranda. It was a beautiful morning, peaceful and warm, and I wanted to take advantage of any kindness I could receive. I had been outside for less than a minute when I heard the door open and close. Sandy. How could I doubt this man? His reason for holding a gun to my head couldn't make me feel any worse than I already did. It wasn't the fact that I divorced him, but the fact that I believed he cheated on me. That was the reason he didn't want to live anymore. I don't deserve this person's love. He was always the best person at almost everything. Loving our children was the only way I equaled him in any way. I prayed that he would continue to be a better person and give me another chance to try to earn his love. He went outside, probably to sort out his feelings. His confession must have had an effect on him. While sitting in my chair, I prayed to God to give me words that would express my repentance so that my husband could give me his grace by accepting the broken woman back into his life. My daughters knew what was on my mind. Jenna lifted me out of my chair while Haley helped me fix my face. Both girls smiled at me and told me to go outside and talk to their father. I took a deep breath and took my first steps into an unknown future. Michael was still standing, looking towards the back of the lot, but he was looking at nothing in particular. The sun was just rising, and the light was breaking through a gap in the trees, highlighting his figure. It felt like I was being shown the path to redemption. The light showed many more changes than I initially realized. Michael has truly turned this land into a true vacation home. After a night on the veranda and seeing the improvements, I realized why everyone loves it here. Michael, can we talk? He didn't say anything or make any move to indicate that this was normal. 
I started to lose hope before I even had time to ask for forgiveness again. He turned to me and I saw tears rolling down his cheeks. Michael, why are you crying? His next words shocked me. Sandy, please forgive me. Why on earth should he ask for forgiveness? You said earlier that you were in the hospital and that's where I failed. I should have been there for you, so I ask you to forgive me. After everything I did to him, and he apologized for not being with me, my stay in the hospital was my own fault, and I made that clear to him, explaining that all my actions over the last couple of months were the result of my refusal to accept the fact that I was getting old and the irrational belief that he would leave for a younger woman, which will satisfy his sexual needs. When Blanche and Stan forced me to go to the party, I was forced to admit how terribly wrong I was. It overwhelmed me to the point that it led to an emotional breakdown. I also talked about hormonal imbalances and the need for medications. I again apologized for my actions and asked for forgiveness and a second chance to remain his wife, willing to suffer any humiliation, if only he would hug me again and never let me go. Throughout my confession, his eyes never stopped expressing the same care he had shown since our wedding day. The love this person can give is enormous, and I gave it up for a short time, but never ever again. Tears rolled down, and I lowered my head. His hand lifted my face so I was looking at him. His thumb wiped the tears from my face, and he pulled me towards him, wrapping his arms around me. Michael I listened as Sandy talked about how hard it was for her to turn 50, about feelings of inadequacy and expectations that I would leave her. This was not a made-up story. The emotion that came out with every word proved that she was telling the truth. Thankfully, her hospital stay turned out to be nothing serious, but at least it identified a problem that could be controlled with medication. Sandy was truly remorseful and tried her best to make things right. The big question I had to ask myself was, do I think we can overcome this, and do I even want to try? No part of our marriage vows is less important than another. For better or for worse was now an oath I had to keep. Where do we go from here, Sandy? Are you ready to give your ex-suicidal, temporarily insane, moderate drunk husband a second chance? Sandy. Oh God, yes. Yes, yes, more than anything in the world, yes. If only you're willing to give your ex-temporarily insane, hormonally imbalanced 50-year-old wife a second chance. When Michael agreed to give me a second chance, I felt like the world was new again. We were quickly surrounded by our children, who embraced us in a group hug. Of course, they overheard our conversation and wanted to join in the beginning of our restoration. We spent several days in the cabin, talking and interacting as a family, as we always did. Except that for me... The time spent in the cabin was a wonderful adventure. Why I never gave this place a chance before was a mistake that I'm very happy to correct. I asked Michael and the girls if we could come here more often, to which they readily agreed. Michael and I really made the cabin feel more like a vacation home for our later years. The nights spent on the veranda, quietly holding Michael's hands, were the nights I remember most vividly. Michael it's hard to believe it's been a year since Sandy and I began another phase of our marriage. It wasn't all easy and fun, overcoming, well, everything. But we made it through. Sandy's medication helped her feel better, but overall lifestyle changes, including a healthy diet and exercise program, helped her self-esteem, losing the baby fat she had carried since Haley was born 22 years ago. Sandy's improved body condition and new sense of self led to new challenges for me. Sex, sex, and more sex. I don't know where this monster dignity thing Sandy keeps talking about comes from. I am no more kinky than any other man. Now all this woman wants is to make love constantly. My God, I'm just one man. Sometimes we don't leave bed all day. The medications for her hormones and the little blue pill for me really proved that you can have a better life through chemistry. Physical love was only one of the changes that occurred after our time in the cabin. We started several counseling sessions to help us stay focused. My family was still very shaken by my suicidal thoughts, and I agreed that it was wrong to do so. They all watched me carefully for some time, until the consultant convinced them that this was the culmination of events that had led me to want to use my revolver 
and blow my head off. For Sandy, counseling helped her accept that gravity will catch up with us all. Loose skin will get us all sooner or later, but the way we live from here until then allows us to say to old age, kiss our asses. I had one more surprise for my wife, and if I had survived her beating, we would have been fine. You see, Rachel and I actually met, but not in the way you think. Sandy It's hard to believe that Rachel and I became good friends after I accused her last year, but that's what happened. Her ability to accept someone's flaws was limitless. It probably goes hand in hand with the type of work she does. As a party planner, she encounters all sorts of people, many of whom are unpleasant. Rachel asked me to help her with an upcoming event. Listening to her describe her job and what she gets from bringing people joy and time to forget about life for a while and just enjoy friends and family was satisfying. So when she asked me to be the hostess for the event, I agreed. However, I tried to refuse when I found out that it would be on the same night as my birthday. It had only been a year since everything had gone wrong, and the memories of that night were still fresh in my mind. I'm sure Michael didn't forget either. That's why I wanted to be with him. But he convinced me that it would be okay if I helped Rachel, and that we would still celebrate my birthday after my duties as hostess were completed. He promised to pick me up after the event and we'd go from there. The little bastard set me up. Michael Sandy didn't get to enjoy her 50th birthday as much as she should have. It's a milestone that each of us should celebrate, and I was determined to give it to her, even if it's a year late. That's what I meant by connecting with Rachel. We repeated everything from last year, except we used a different hotel for the party. Rachel talked Sandy into hosting her own party. She was hesitant because it was her birthday, but I was able to convince her that we would celebrate after completing her duties as a hostess. Rachel walked with Sandy, detailing her hostess duties, essentially directing where to meet people and how to usher them through the ballroom entrance. Rachel was a person who paid attention to detail, so she walked Sandy through every step. The door to the ballroom was guarded by Rachel's husband, which didn't seem unusual to Sandy. However, it wasn't until he opened the doors and I stood there with a satisfied grin on my face while a hundred people shouted, Happy Birthday, Sandy, that she realized she'd been set up. The Happy 50th Anniversary banner has been redesigned since last year. A line was drawn through the number 50, and our granddaughters scribbled 51 nearby. Needless to say, this party went off without a hitch and everyone had a great time. Everyone knew what happened last year and were extremely supportive. You can tell how blessed you are by the quality of friends and family you have. Sandy and I are very blessed. The private party after that Sandy and I had was very biblical. Sandy blessed me numerous times. Here's to next year. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.